So uh, uh, today we have uh, here with us uh, Aparecida Bilasa. Uh, she's a professor in anthropology in the National Museum of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, uh, here in, in, in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, well, it's our, an, an honor to, to, to have her here. And uh, I will say that she's one of the best known uh, anthropologists in, in Brazil. And uh, you might ask, well, why I have invited anthropologists to talk about ecological economics? And uh, well, first of all, I think this um, ecological economics has, has been always characterized by a dialogue with other disciplines, including other social sciences. And uh, secondly, because one of the research subject of Aparecida is the, the relationship between humans and, and nature. And uh, well, she, uh, she will talk more about her, her research. And, and I think that in ecological economics, we can really learn a lot from, um, from um, anthropological perspective on, on this uh, complex relationship. Um, so, and um, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for us having accepted the invitation to be with, with us uh, today. And um, and I would like to 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 say also that uh, uh, that I loved your your book uh, uh, Palito and Me, which uh, which well initially was pro uh, uh, published in Portuguese uh, Palito e Eu. So now we have two versions. I don't know if there are uh, more versions coming in other languages, but I will really. Yeah, uh, it's one of the most uh, fascinating books I have read uh, in the last three years. And um, it is not really for a specialist, it's, re it's, it's written for a very broad audience. It, and it's a, it's a lovely book uh, because of different reasons. Uh, but I think what, what I like, one of the things that I like the most is, is like a, a, a Palito's uh, own life experience. I mean, uh, uh, all, all that he has, experience in his uh, long life and uh, um, from from being a, a, a totally forest person without uh, contact with the Western world uh, through the process of, of uh, contacting, you know, this other Brazil. And um, and also the experience of, of meeting you and coming to the city and also at the end of his life of becoming uh, Christian. I think it's so, if you account all his life, is full of experiences and you know, a very rich life. And, and, um, and also because, uh, uh, um, I mean, in your in relationship with him, uh, I mean, we can learn a lot, a lot of, uh, about our own culture, I guess it was your, also your experience, your personal experience that, that you, uh, and I think it's, 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 it's a, uh, the, the experience of anthropologists in general, it's like a, you can learn a lot about your own, culture, your own personality, and a really transformation, transformational process, I guess, uh, uh, for you and for all uh, or anthropologists, uh, because it's a kind of mirror. Uh, uh, looking at the others, you can look yourself. Um, so uh, your book shows it very well, how, how uh, it was a big transformation for, for you uh, uh, to engage uh, with the Wadi. Uh, and also uh, uh, how uh, we can learn from, from those interactions and uh, from those intercultural um, exchanges. And I think it's just, uh, uh, we need a lot of more to learn from um, other cultures and, and given the crisis of the, of the Western world and especially the environmental crisis of the, of the Western world. So thanks again. And um, maybe we can start uh, uh, with with a summary of the of your book, I will I will put a link to interested people to here in the in the video so they can they can buy the book um, and maybe you can just give an, a brief account of your of your book. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, on my book, it was uh, originally published in Portuguese in 2018 by Editora Todavia, and the name was Palito e Eu, Memórias de Meu Pai Indígena. And it came out uh, last year, September 2021, by Stanford University Press. 
name it uh, Palito and Me, Memories of My Indigenous Father. And there is a Spanish also uh, edition by Casa de las Americas because the, the book won the prize for essays in the Casa de las Americas. So they published the, the book in Cuba. So we have three, uh, three editions. And um, the book is about, uh, it was written um, as soon as I lost my, my indigenous father, uh, named Palito. He was a man of about 80 years old. And I began to write the book uh, because of my grief. It was a way to, to remember him and to deal with my pain. And then I began, my, my first uh, intention was to, to write about his life, his, uh, the history of his life, because his lifespan was uh, amazing because he was in the forest, like uh, never, uh, never, never seen our, our civilization or our society. From there, from, and, and within 50 years, he, he was, you know, totally, um, he knew lots of things. He came to Rio de Janeiro to visit me and he was able to talk in Skype and everything. So this man in his span of life, his, his lifespan, he just came from the forest to know lots of technologies and everything. And he, he went through lots of things like wars and, and massacres the whites uh, shooting at the Wari and epidemics where two thirds of their population was, was decimated by um, either pneumonia or uh, influenza and, and, uh, and diarrhea and things like that. So I try to, to, to tell in a very uh, non-academic language because the book was meant to non-academic people. And for them to, to know his life, one of my, 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 my aims was to make Palito known because I, I thought he was such an extraordinary person that people should know him uh, around the world. He was just amazing. And then he was brilliant and very intelligent. And then I, I so my, my, my first uh, goal was to, write about his life but then I kept getting to the story just imagining his life in the past and remembering the time we spent together and everything so the book has myself in it too so that's why it's Palito and me because there's a lot of me my 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 struggles to understand the way life and my struggle to be an anthropologist uh, everything that I went through and everything and, and my relationship with Palito, which is, you know, a, a son, a, a daughter, father relation. And his trips to Rio de Janeiro and how he, he became amazed by city things and everything. So, and my kids, I took both my kids, two sons, uh, since they were little. So it's, it's a lot about maternity in the field too. Well, congratulations uh, for the prize. And uh, well, it's wonderful also to have the, the book in, in Spanish. And uh, well, I think you have achieved your world goal. So now Palito will be very much known in different languages. And, and um, I, 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 so I, I, as I said before, I, I was amazed by what, what you said that all the, that he has experienced in one life and it is normally, <laughs> It's a kind of having in one life like a five five centuries, no? But I mean, from from encountering the Western civilization, uh, even to 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 become Christian at at, at the end, uh, uh, was was surprising for me. Um, so uh, one of uh, some of your recent papers are about uh, um, Christianization and the consequences of Christianization among the Wadi people. And it's, it's, it's very uh, interesting as well that uh, it has not, historically it has not made only one way process, but they, they has experienced sometimes conversion and then uh, what you call deconversion. So they have, <laughs> and then, then, then they have converted again. Um, and that's something that I really, really didn't expect. And, um, and it's quite interesting. Um, um, and but I think that in general your your uh, 
both personal life and, 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 and academic life has been about encounters and like meeting, uh, uh, meeting people then. And in, for the Wadi, I think that's those encounters with the Western uh, culture has been has dramatic in one sense, as you have said, uh, because of epidemics and, uh, but also um, uh, has been also very complex and uh, it cannot be interpreted only uh, as, a, I guess, as a, uh, uh, as a destructive uh, experience uh, um, because they are still alive and they are still interacting with our culture in a very creative way. And um, so maybe you can you um, tell us more about the Wari people? I, I think it's important for people who do not know uh, who the Wari are. Um, and maybe uh, it's difficult to summarize <laughs> a whole uh, a civilization, a whole culture, but um, well, maybe um, uh, very briefly, what um, a, a summary of uh, uh, the general uh, characteristics of the Wadi people, where they live and what they do. Okay, okay. <laughs> so the Wadi, they are an indigenous people from Amazonia, Brazil. They live in the state of Rondonia, which is, uh, they live right uh, close to the frontier with Bolivia. So it's southwestern Amazonia. And uh, they, they, they speak a language of the Chapacuran family. And most of the other speakers, uh, other people who spoke uh, the Chapacuran language, they are extinct now. They were exterminated by the white. There are not so many. And the white escaped because they, they, they like to live in the upriver. So they like to live. Uh, far from the big rivers. So that's, that's why they, they escaped. Um, so they, uh, they until, um, uh, until 19, 19 something, 1940 or something, they, they used it to live uh, in peace among themselves. And, but by that moment, so they, they, they were the rubber tuckers that came uh, in the beginning of the 19th uh, century, but they already managed to escape. But uh, in the 1940 and, and, you know, during the Second World War, the rubber tappers came back and they invaded more and more. They went up and up river. So they, they found the Wadi and they, they made wars because, because there was, you know, their capacity to make war was unmeasurable. They had shot, shooting guns and, and everything. So they used it to get into Wadi villages very early in the morning to, to get there when everybody was sleeping. And then they, they, they came just immediately shooting everyone. So Palito's family was was shot during one of those. I, I tell this in this book. One of those uh, invasions, his wife and his little daughter, they were shot in front of him, and uh, so it, it was very very uh, dramatic and horrible. And then they there there came the epidemics because with the war in force. The you know everyone like the the church the Catholic Church and the the, the missionaries the evangelical missionaries who were already in Hondonia from the U S and also the government they wanted to pacify the Wadi of course they wanted the you know to open up the the way for the rubber tappers and to to get in and so they they sent expeditions to pacify, meaning that they, people went there with no health checkup, anything in boats, uh, carrying axes and knives and things like that, gifts to the Indians, and went there, you know, leaving the, the, the gifts and everything to try to, to attract them. And as they were not checked anything, so lots of people were, were uh, ill, and a huge epidemic spread all over their territory. And two thirds of the population was uh, uh, exterminated with the epidemics. 
So it was really, they had a dramatic, dramatic um, life, you know, social, social encounter with the whites. And then uh, the pacification, as they call it, uh, happened in the 60s, 1962, 63. And then they, they, they came to live around in their territory, but not close to the missionaries and, and the government stations. So they were there and the missionaries uh, coming from the US, uh, they were evangelical fundamentalists from the south of the US. And they, they began to convert them, trying to learn the language and then begin translation and, and teach people, prepare them to be pastors. And they, so they, they begin by producing uh, uh, written material. And within these materials, they were always criticizing their culture, saying that all the, the ancestors were liars and the devil was the one who was talking to them. That's why they believe that the animals are humans and, and, and things like that. So the Wadi were massively um, kind of ideologized so, uh, by the Christian missionaries, not just about uh, Christianity and God and everything, but also about, uh, about uh, mis misrepresenting or, or um, criticizing their ancestors and their way of life. So it was very, very rude and cruel, and uh, and they were converted because they were. You can imagine they they had lots and lots of relatives dead. They were about. They were completely lost in this new situation, and then came the missionaries with antibiotics, giving them, and they used it to say that the antibiotics. Uh, were not the, you know, who, uh, which was curing them were not the antibiotics, but God. So the Wari immediately associated the power of the, the drugs with God's power, and they were totally lost at that moment, and they all converted. But then you know, one of the reasons they, they converted was that, you know, they are going to get rid of the diseases because God will protect them. But then, after some time, of course, they, they became ill again, and people began to deconvert, to, to leave Christianity, they say, to leave God. And in 2000, and then they spent the 80s and 90s, uh, like, coming back to their traditional life. But in 2000, uh, 2011, 2001, 11, you know, the, the World Trade Center attack, <laughs> September 11, 2001. Yeah, and then uh, they saw on the TV uh, that they had one TV, collective TV um, in the village. They saw the attacks to the World Trade Center. The missionaries who were present said that this is the, the, the sign that the, the big war was coming. So it was a sign that the end of the world will be coming as in the apocalypse where you will have a big, big uh, war and everything and, and, and God will come back, Jesus will come back. So lots of people reconverted. They were really afraid because they already know the, how powerful the whites are, their, their arms, are their, you know, their, their guns and everything. They were scared, they converted. And of course they converted and it's, uh, you know, conversion means also that they, um, they still fight, but they, they, they try to control fights. They, they try to control animosities and everything. So there is something that is uh, worth also. So now from 2001 until now, like 20 years, they, they're still, uh, they still uh, uh, Christians. So they go to church, they do not do their rituals, their traditional rituals anymore, but they are there and they speak their language, which is wonderful. And they, they hunt and they, and they grow crops and everything. So 
they are pretty much alive as a culture and and people and they are having kids and they their population is growing and they say that they they are okay so i am the one who is more shocked shocked with you know what this change because i when i arrived there in the 80s the beginning of the 80s i saw what I, I understood as a traditional life. They had their rituals and their shamans and everything. And suddenly when I came back in 2002, everything was already uh, what, not happening anymore. So they, they, they had interrupted everything. So that's what changed it. But they are pretty much alive. I am the one shocked. But maybe we can um, talk more about um, the human na nature relationship, but what, what are the uh, implication of, of all these changes in, in the way they, they relate to the, well, what we call the natural environment, or what we call uh, nature. And, um, um, because you, you are part of an of a intellectual tradition here in, in, in Brazil that, uh, that started, if I'm not mistaken, with uh, um, Ibero de Castro, so, who was your supervisor, right? And um, and then this tradition is what which is, has received the name of uh, Amerindian perspectivism. Uh, proposes that um, well, that the way Amerindian societies relate to to the forest or to the natural environment in general uh, is uh, radically different from the way we the westerners uh, uh, people from the western culture deal with it and and uh, and that's why i personally think that uh, we have a lot to learn from from them at least with regard to the uh, to the way we relate to the environment because the west culture has basically well a very destructive relationship with the with the forest and uh, with nature in general not only the forest but also with water and in brazil is uh, this tragic the state of water sources. And, and um, so according to this uh, uh, proposition, correct me if, if I am mistake, uh, is uh, the, the common element between humans and non-human is, is culture. Huh? While for the Western world, uh, culture, we, we differentiate culture from nature and as two separate, as two dichotomic categories. Um, and what's, that's basically what differentiates, uh, hierarchically differentiate humans from the na natural environment. Huh? It's not only different, but also it's, it's a relationship based on a, on a hierarchy. So it's a very anthropocentric. Uh, uh, and that, that also relates to, to the utilitarian way of dealing with nature. Yeah? It's like a, um, and it, it has to do with ecological economics because one of the key concepts in ecological economics uh, during the past decades has been the, the concept of ecosystem services. So it, the, this idea that nature is a kind of capital yeah, that provides services to human society. And uh, according to your uh, interpretation, I think we can uh, track back to the myth of origin of uh, Christianity that, you know, God created nature, uh, heaven uh, in, um, to serve the uh, Adam and, and Eve and to serve the, the human. And um, so uh, while for the, the, the proposition of uh, Meridian perspectivism, the proposition is that uh, um, culture is the common element between humans and, and, and non-human and it's the body uh, which changes. Uh, while, for example, for the Western culture, we have a kind of this, uh, this gen common, is the body the common element, right? Because it's ge genetics, we come from the same, have the same origin and it's genetics, what is the common element between human and, and the natural environment. So maybe you can explain a bit better um, this perspective and, uh, and uh, what is it about and uh, why you think it's, it's appropriate to describe uh, the way, way of relating to, to, to the forest. Okay, so among the Wari and, and uh, among several other Amazonian peoples, not all, but several others, um, animals and for some, some people too, trees and other vegetables, uh, they are human. 
that means that they they have a potential humanity uh, that manifests itself sometimes to some eyes or to some perspectives. They themselves, for the wadi, for example, the uh, several animal species, they see themselves as human beings. So they have their houses and they have a family and they do festivals and they prepare their meals and they dance and they everything and they go out to hunt everything. But uh, we usually, uh, except for the shamans, we cannot see them this way. We don't have the eyes. So this is what was you know, happening in mythic times when animals and humans, they all can communicate, could communicate. They all have kind of bodies that can you know, uh, see each other in, in their human form. But in cosmological times, they differentiated. So uh, humans became, you know, what they are and animals, they, they are differentiated according to their bodies, which we call different species uh, or kinds of animals. And, uh, but animals and, and, and sometimes they, they, so when they go hunting, for example, when they see a, a, an indigenous person or a non-indigenous person and they, they attack like a jaguar, for example, we see with our eyes a jaguar attacking an animal, but the jaguar himself and a shaman will look and, and, and the jaguar himself will see, you know, that he is a human person with bow and arrows uh, just hunting and the shaman will see the same. So, um, so the animals, they see themselves as humans hunting or everything. And sometimes they say that the animals want people for themselves. That's what the Wadi say. So the, uh, an animal like a jaguar or a tapir or some animal, they can kidnap Wadi people. Just they, they make this person see uh, itself, the animal, as a human being, like a mother or a nephew or someone, and carry the person to be part of, of, of his society. And what happens is that when the person is kidnapped or even a hunt, uh, the person acquires uh, a body like the animal. So a body is something more than it is for us because it includes habits and, and feelings and everything. So when you go out with you know, someone like a jaguar who is human, and you, you hunt with him and you just eat his food and do things, you become a jaguar yourself because it's all about uh, habits and bodies. And so you can change, you can pass from one kind of humanity to another, which means that you change uh, your, you, the context and the relationships. So you had some relationships with the white you or you know, other kinds of human beings, and then you move to the jaguar society and then you became yourself a jaguar because you're eating like a jaguar with the jaguars and doing what jaguars do so usually so people communicate with animals and and animals with people through uh those transformations and the shaman is the one who uh usually has uh the shaman has a kind of double uh, another body that he can mm -hmm. produce or come out or exist uh, mm -hmm. at his will. And he, this, this second body will just live with the animals, be there, stay with the animals and everything. So the shaman is the one who can circulate from one human context to another without dying. Because if people do that, usually they die, they become the animal. So, other Amazonian people, they have the same relationship with, with vegetables, for example, with trees. And so there, is a, uh, there are lots of new works, new ethnographies on the humanity of vegetables, which is very interesting because it's very new. It's from, I don't know, 10 years uh, back. And before that, you know, we were very concentrated on animals and the relationship with animals. But now the, you know, the vegetables became uh also the focus of attention of the anthropologists so of course if 
<clears throat> if uh, animals and, and, and trees, they are human beings, uh, you have to relate differently with, with them. So you, you must have some rules and respect and reciprocity because if it does not work, you're gonna be, you know, um, there will be consequences. Consequences like, uh, big consequences like uh, a, a climatic or, you know, a big rain or something and individual consequences like disease and death. Yeah, I think that uh, Bibero de Castro uses the, uh, the metaphor of a kind of um, political relations. I mean, everything becomes a matter of politics, uh, uh, the way you relate to the non-humans. Uh, uh, while the West, uh, I think a Western culture has taken, uh, has done the opposite, I and mean, has moved in the opposite direction, that is taking out agency from the natural world, right? Uh, and that entitles humans to, first of all, to dominate uh, the natural world and to, and even to, to have the idea that of, of, of ownership of prop, um, property, no? which is really uh, preposterous, like <laughs> the idea that you can own a forest, for example, that it can be a property, a private property right. Uh, you can impose private property rights on the forest, which I guess that for everybody is, is completely nonsense, right? Um, the idea of private property right um, of the forest. And so, so maybe you can explain a bit more about rights, uh, the allocation of rights um, among the Wari. I mean, um, now that we are going, because I guess, for example, property right of the forest doesn't exist. Um, and I think that the, the, what we see, for example, now the, the illegal appropriation of the forest in Brazil, this is still the expansion of uh, grillage, which is the violent appropriation of the forest and clearing of the forest um, by illegal means and by violent means, which they, uh, with the goal of, uh, uh, you know, imposing uh, private property rights on, on the land. No, it's the land is much more important uh, than the forest. And um, I guess for, the, the, for, main, uh, for forest culture is quite the opposite. <laughs> The forest, uh, the forest is, first of all, is populated, right? It's, it's full of things and, and living and societies uh, equivalent to our societies. While for the little, um, uh, the forest is, is, is empty, right? Uh, and uh, and uh, actually the paradox in Brazil is that the economic value of the clear land is higher than a forested land. So there are economic incentives to, to, yeah, to clear, to appropriate by, by illegal means uh, public land, to clear it and then to speculate with it, and that, that's one of the main major drivers of deforestation nowadays uh, in Brazil. It's also one one of the major drivers of our CO two emissions in the case of Brazil because land use changes are the uh, is the most important share of Brazilian contribution to to climate change, right? Right. Um, so maybe you can very briefly talk more about the the allocation of rights among the Guari. Um, yeah, traditionally, of course, nobody had rights on the forest because it, it, you know all you have there are different societies human beings, so they have agency and they have their own, you know, agenda. So you cannot own them. They, they, they can do things and they can react and they can punish uh, humans, of course. So of course uh, you don't have it. Of course, you know, you can, you can say that people, they have their lands in a way that they, they, they have their place to grow crops, and, but everything among the Wadi at least was negotiated, was not something that you had from birth or anything. So. But now all they need is, uh, is to have their lands because their, their lands, even their, because in Brazil, as you may know, the lands 
they they belong to the union to the state but they you know the the indigenous people they are the uh, the people who uh, how to say usufrutuarios uso so the people who have the right over the land so they have the right they don't have like uh, you know papers uh, saying that you can so they cannot sell their land because the land do not belong to them but they they have the right and what is happening now is that it's being violated because those lands they are they are um, they are demarcated they are they are legally you know um, they are legalized as part of you know this group territory and that group territory and it, it was usually made with anthropologists and indigenous and people and 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 part of you know the indigenous people who could do the work too so they they try to identify you know traditional sites and sacred sites and everything to 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 kind of legalize it so they have the indigenous territories but now what is happening is that people they are they are implicitly and even explicitly uh incentivated to to get into those lands and as you said a clear land has more value than a forested land because then you 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 can sell it and you bring cattle which is not you know uh not a good thing uh, in, in any sense because it destroys the 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 earth and the soil and everything and then the you you have a kind of um uh sterile um land territory but i think that one of the the most dangerous things that you have now is the gold miners the illegal gold miners and they are they are invading heavily indigenous territories mainly in the tapajos river and also in in many other rivers in in amazonia but the tapajos where the munduruku people live it's heavily invaded and they are destroying the rivers they are restraining the forests and and they are contaminating the the waters with with mercury and this is one hidden thing and not visible that is very dangerous so wari land the land where the wari live uh, there is a lot of mercury the 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 miners they live in in they came into the Madeira River, which is part of their, their ecosystem, and they uh, and they are invading and they and they made a study of the wari fish that the wari fish and people's bodies and there is a lot of mercury, and I don't know if people know about mercury, but there is a kind of disease that is named Minamata disease, that was discovered in Japan in the Minamata Bay and it affects uh, your brain and, and it, it gets to because the mercury gets through the brain tissues and through the placenta. So uh, pregnant women and uh, the, the fetus is immediately affected and the brain too. So you have neurological problems like trembling and people that could not uh, handle things and everything. So you have lots of it, of this among the Yanomami, which is uh, also a land heavily invaded, among the Munduruku, Apiaka and other indigenous people. So I think that mercury and gold mining is something that is kind of mis misrepresented because uh because it has side effects that were not immediately visible so what we need we are in chaos here in brazil it's it's chaotic what is happening so invasions everywhere and those people they are kind of of uh, uh sustained by huge corporations international ones in case of the gold mining we know that comes from canada and other places um and and so it's happening and they are getting sick 
they are no mummy. You can see all this, you know, in all newspapers, you see how violence is, you know, they are, they are suffering a lot of violence and contamination. So um, I, I don't know what to say. I, I just, I'm, I'm very worried and, and scared even and, and sad about what is happening. But what they, the indigenous people, they are asking for now is to have their territory guaranteed. So, uh, you know, they, they must have uh, limits uh, respected and, and uh, yeah, their limits. So they, they must have a territory. They must have their land. That's what they need. That's what they say. If we have our land guaranteed, if nobody else uh, gets into our land to explore it, it's okay, we're gonna leave. But this is essential for them. This is the main thing that they need. And of course, not just because they, they extract resources like uh, you know, fish and, and animals and everything, but also because that's their, you know, their religious life. They, you know, they, they, they talk with the animals, so the animals help them to cure and vegetables and everything. So they, they need it for several reasons, for subsistence, but also for religious uh, reasons. And what we are you know, getting here to understand at the moment with the climate emergency and, and those big uh, rains and, and droughts and everything is that they are right in a way that you really have to, to treat the forest differently because you have a living organism there, a, a living being that you cannot just go there and cut the trees. If not, you know, if we say, oh no, they are not uh, humans or they are, but they are, it's a living being. And I'm a biologist, I'm an ecologist too. I have, you know, uh, uh, my university was, my, my grade was in biology. And I, I studied before knowing the indigenous people and their religious life. I knew that the forest was a living being, that everything is connected. So if you just kill the animals, you just interrupt the whole chain, the whole, the whole food chain, a, a chain among them. And then you just, uh, if you cut the trees, you, you, you change everything, you change the soil. In Amazonia, the soil is really like thin like that. So you need, the, the trees to be there, just giving it all the time that, you know, organic matter for it to, to, to renew. And if you, if you take it, it's, so it's not just that, oh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cut this small piece of land and everything will be all right. It's not because everything is linked. So you have the, 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 the rains and the, the everything, the winds and everything. So, uh, let's say that, you know, the religious life of the indigenous people does not interest us. Let's say that. But, you know, they have a kind of fundamental principle, a fundamental basis that is totally true in scientific, uh, you know, parameters. It's, it, they are all living beings and they are connected. So if not, you know, a jaguar is talking to you, but, you know, jaguars are part of this environment and you have to preserve the whole thing. So we are, we are, we are getting the consequences. It's, you know, I don't know if, if, uh, if you know, people uh, have already heard about the, the famous book by David Copenau and Bruce Albert, The Falling Sky. The Falling Sky is a beautiful book about a Yanomami shaman talking to the white, to us, just having the patience to tell us what is nature. That's what he's doing. Listen, he says, listen, we know for generations what nature is. Nature is, 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 is alive. It's, it's human too. It's, it's, it's completely, we have to, to deal differently with it. So uh, it's not that, you know, we have from their point of view, it's not just that they, they have to respect nature, but they are part of it. There is no nature culture, but you know, they are, everything is immersed in this, in this living um, big uh, creature that is us 
and and what we call nature. Yeah, it's nice. You mentioned the, the book, um, The Fallen Sky. I will also put the link uh, to that book here. It's also in English. And uh, it's, um, it's also a very interesting book because it's the result of a that of an interaction and encounter between the big Copenhagen and and uh, an anthropologist there, uh, right? And then it's a, a kind of a very productive encounter. Um, and uh, everybody should read that, that book. I, I fully agree. And um, and uh, and uh, if you if you could put the link, I have uh, a, 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 I, I wrote uh, a, a piece to a, a journal here called Piaui. It's mm -hmm. a very known, very known one. magazine. Yeah, yeah, magazine. And and it's called Mal Invisível, the invisible evil. And it's all about mercury and, and contamination and deforestation. And I think that it might interest people to have sure. it. Sure. And uh, well, we, we, you talk about the... Uh, well, Interesting. I also have an undergraduate degree in biology. I, I, we have a similar path. <laughs> I started in biology and moved into social sciences. And, and um, the, uh, so you mentioned about the, the physical threats, like uh, extremely important uh, uh, physical threats that has been uh, dramatically aggra aggravated uh, during this government. Uh, well, the Bolsonaro government has not declared a single uh, uh, indigenous territory. In, uh, the past three years and and uh, has allowed uh, the gold miners and, uh, and the grilleros and to, to invade the territories and as a kind of state policy right um uh, so it's just terrible but maybe we can talk more about that um just to finalize uh, this last part of the uh, of our conversation about the kind of crystallization that uh, the wadi experienced uh, and what are the consequences for the Exactly what we we were talking about about the way they relate uh, to the forest. Uh, in, in your last papers, you talk about both processes like a Christianization and formal education as like a two important uh, mechanisms of uh, you know um, that are affecting uh, the what is in, in different ways. So I would like that you talk more. Do you think that really they they represent threats or not? And, um, and uh, I also was interested in this kind of f flexible interaction with Christianity that they have had, it seems that they have had historically, that they can, during some periods they can convert, and in other periods they, they can come back to their uh, previous uh, uh, traditions and, and habits, and, um, and, uh, and then they could <laughs> uh, convert again. So it reminds me a bit um, of, of what, what um, um, Afro-Brazilian culture experience uh, during uh, colon the colonial times. And um, you know that uh, there was Christianization, forced Christianization of the slaves. But um, despite that, the, the African religions could survive during many centuries. So, and. Uh, and this um, uh, this was possible because well many slaves adopted the symbols of the of the Catholic Church, but but hidden that I mean below that they were not you know still uh, continuing with their own uh, old traditions and uh, or and being polytheistic and uh, um, so there was a kind of two two interpretation uh, one superficial interpretation about the you know, rituals that apparently were Catholic, but be, behind that, their, 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 their traditional uh, rites and, and, and uh, were still very much alive. And they're, they're, they survive, actually survived and they are very much alive today, which is very surprising after so many centuries of, of repression and forced Christianization. Um, so what, what kind of Christianization do you think that uh, what we are experiencing and and do, they, uh, do you think that these two processes, like a formal education and Christianization, are, are fundamentally changing them and the way do re they relate to the, to the forest? I do. I do think. I think that Christianization and scholarization, is, they come together. Not that, you know, I'm not talking, uh, you know, it's not their words, because, of course, 
education, formal education is, is central for them at the moment, of course, because that's the way they can fight and they can fight for their rights. So you see uh, this beautiful uh, Chai Surui, who was uh, in the COP26, which is, she was wonderful. And she's from Hondonia, the same state as the Wari. And she was really educated. So he went, she went to schools and university and she could speak English. So it's essential. They, they, they need now to represent themselves. So education is essential, but Christianity is not from my point of view. But, you know, it, it comes together because uh, our own, like the Western, yeah, urban, urban Western people, our own view uh, of the environment is, is very linked to Christianity. So as you said in the beginning, uh, in the Genesis, God says, I will create the animals for you, for you to, to use them for, for your service. So it is something that guides until now our relationship to nature, that uh, we are superior to nature and we control, we can control and nature has to be subsumed, subdued by you know our actions. So this is of course what what made you know possible to uh, the way we you know we explore the nature until now. So it's there. So it's very Christian in a way. It's the Christian principle that comes, of course, before from the Greeks and everything and science and but. Uh, Christianity gave a kind of divine um, a proof or divine view of what you know was being uh, discussed at the time before it. So what I think is that Christianization, it's not just because people change, they do not uh, kind of, you know, talk to the spirits, but talk to God or something. It's not just you know, a, 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 a change of deities. But Christianity comes with a charge of individualism, uh, economicism, like, you know, uh, uh, exchanges and values, and the idea that you, you are, you know, uh, uh, an individual just related to God directly, but you, you can be separate from other persons. So, for example, at, at the limit, when you die, you go by yourself, by your actions. You have nothing to do with what your, your parents did or your brother or sister or wife or something. So this idea of an individual was not something that, that you know, was shared by the indigenous people. They felt themselves as part of society, as related to people. So you cannot be separate from your parents or your kids. You are part of their bodies. So what a person eats could affect, you know, the body of his uh, spouse or kids or brothers or sisters. So Christianity came with individualization. And individualization, from my point of view, is the, the door, you know, to, for you to to explore things, to, to, to introduce economic relations. So the missionaries, they came with the word of God, but they also came with the idea that you, you do that, I pay. If you don't do, I won't pay. So they want to teach the Indians to, to do uh, commerce, to do, you know, to do deals. And everything was came with you know the word of god and it all came together so the genesis was the, the you know the first book that they taught to the wadi and it impressed the wadi a lot because you know they said oh so god created everything we thought that everything was there just for you know for themselves nobody created it they do not have a creator the wadi so then they said, oh, so God said that we can, we can eat everything. No animal will cause us illness or anything. So let's eat. So the idea that you can explore that, you know, the, 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 the possibility of objectifying the animals who were subjects before is a key, a door, you know, to all this ideology of, you know, 
exploitation and everything to come in. So Christianity is much more than a talk about God and Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit. Christianity is much more. Christianity is individuality. It's uh, capitalism, everything that comes together. So I think that the Wadi now, because the, you know, the, 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 the reconversion happened in, the, in, in 2001, so 20 years from now. So you have a whole generation and maybe a second one because people there, they are fathers and mothers very, very, until, you know, very early, like with 16 years old or something. So we have one generation and a half who, uh, who grew up listening to, to the Bible, not to the myth. And the old people who were there to recount the myths, to, to teach tradition, let's say, the ritual, they are dead now. They are dying. They are dying just fast, like my Wari father Palito. So how, how could they come back? That's what they say. Sometimes they say to me, there is no old people now to, to teach us how to do things because our children, they just know the Bible. So how to come back? So you think, you think the, the second conversion, you, what you are oh, saying, it has been different from the first one in the sense that it's more totally. irreversible. Um, totally. Seems to be it, irreversible. Yeah. It, does, it does not mean so. I do not um, agree that, you know, the Wadi, I, I cannot say that the Wadi, they, they are like, you know, the African Americans, African Brazilians you see here, for example, that have, you know, a kind of their religion that, that you know, sometimes can go out, you know, you, they, can, they can show it, sometimes they have to hide it because now at the moment, you know, the political moment, they are pretty much repressed, but, that's not something that they can keep because uh, among the Wadi, several things came together and you cannot say that they can still make their rituals among the Wadi uh, being Christians because they do not fit each other. It doesn't mean that the Wadi, they, 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 they lost all their, you know, um, cosmology or their cosmological thoughts because they still have their language. So, my book, I have a book on Wari Christianity that's called Praying, like, uh, like praying like that, and Praying, like hunting, um, about their Christianity. And what I, I, I try to show in the book, it's, it's from California University Press. Uh, what I, I try to show is that, you know, true translation, you know, the, the translation process, because the missionaries, the fundamentalist evangelical missionaries, they are there to translate. And through the translation process, they can um, get in touch with their, their cosmology, their ontology, because the names are there. And when they translate, they get a kind of, you know, equivocation and misunderstandings that are very productive. So they kept the... the they kept their language. But do you think that they have, um, because of Christianization, they have adopted more like a, a destructive practices in relation to the, the way they relate to the forest? And, and uh, you, in your paper, you also talk about a kind of um, Western way of dealing with the environment that is it's based on contemplation or, or, you know, this kind of something that in the US was very, uh, was is very present, like at the national parks. And this is, nature is a place where you go to for recreation or for contemplation or for uh, admiration of beauty. Uh, but still, it's something that is different. This is mm. completely, and you keep it like a, the logic of national park is that you really keep it completely isolated from people. That's that's a uh, and. Um, do you think, but you, in your paper, you also mentioned about that, this new way of dealing with nature as a, through contemplation. And maybe to, to close, um, yeah, I don't want to abuse <laughs> with your time. Maybe we can close also talking about, we started talking about, with, uh, about Palito. You can also close talking about Palito, about, uh, about his own experience of Christianization. In the book, you also talk about it uh, because he became Christian very late in his life, right? And um, maybe you can uh, talk about his own 
experience, experience with uh, Christianity and how uh, it affected his uh, way the way dealt with people and with um, and, and who is his own um, aspirations and and, and, um, and life in general. And well, I wanted to thank you again for your uh, kind acceptance and to be here it was it has been a wonderful conversation. I hope that in the future we, we can have a, a second part. It's extremely interesting. I hope that it will be also interesting for many, many people in the community of ecological economics. And thanks again. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, Palito was an extraordinary man. So he was a different kind of Christian. So he was a Christian with, uh, you know, he was a very wadi wild Christian because he, he was, he brought up, he was brought up in the forest with, you know, he was, um, a connoisseur, uh, you know, he was a knowledgeable man. He knew lots of myths and, and traditions and everything. So he kept relating things all the time, all the time. So Palito was not, you know, someone who grew up as a Christian. So it's completely different. Those, those, you know, 20 years old um, young people, they grew up as Christians. So they, they have different values. And, but Palito was completely different. So he was a Christian, but also he could talk and he could say that, you know, animals are there and they are humans. So he's not someone who, because, you know, these young people, they usually say that, you know, the, the, the ancestors or the old ones, they were lying or, you know, things that they said that happened were, did not happen really it was just the devil that made their eyes confused and everything but palito no he said no nowadays the animals they do not approach anymore because they are afraid of us but usually you know in the past they did and it was true i saw it so he was not uh denying the past so he was very alive you know and and so he was not a boring christian or someone who's just you know was citing and citing and quoting and talking about. But I don't know, uh, as people from another countries and in US and other, other places will listen, maybe to what I'm saying that we are, I know I would like to, to close it, to finish, say that we are in Brazil in a very, very uh, delicate situation to say the least. And that, you know, environmentally, I think we, we we are about to get into a turning, you know, no turning point. So a, a place, you know, a point where devastation is so, so huge that, you know, the, the forest will not recover anymore. And lots, lots of, of indigenous people, they are threatened. They are being killed by invaders and they are being uh, poisoned by mercury and other things so i think that if we don't do an international organized action you know we everybody will just lose because we have here uh you know around 200 indigenous people that are threatened so what to do so what to do to stop it we need to stop it. And I think that if we hopefully have a change uh, in the next year, that's what we are praying here for, uh, it will be, might be too late. It might be too late. So we need it now. So we need international, uh, uh, you know, people from everywhere in the world looking at us attentively and denouncing and, and, and showing the world what is happening here in Brazil. It's really, really, I see, you know, I have, for example, during, of course, the pandemic, the, the way the government acted, sending lots of chloroquine and ivermectin, ivermectin to the indigenous people for them to, 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 to take with no scientific uh, guarantee and we know that it does not work. So they sent lots and lots. And until now, now, at that moment, the Minister of Health is saying that chloroquine is effective. So we are being governed by 
by a bunch of crazy people. And of course, we educated people from the cities, we have access to hospitals, and we can, we can filter what is happening. But it's not happening with indigenous people who listen uh, mainly to the evangelical, you know, evangelical people who live in the cities nearby, they send lots of audios, WhatsApp audios, saying that the, the vaccine will has a, a ship from with the devil, you know, a ship from the devil that will change them. And lots of, I, I, I received lots of those, those uh, WhatsApp from my indigenous friends asking me, so what's happening? Should we take the vaccine or not? So it is really, really serious. And we, we know that they died in, in huge amounts here in Brazil by COVID-19 and they are still dying. So, you know, I don't know where to run to, but I think that it's, you know, we need a kind of, of organized action to stop invasions, deforestation, and to protect indigenous land. Yeah, this is extreme. Yeah, this is really uh, so sad and so tragic. Uh, also, the, uh, the way the government de dealt with uh, chloroquine, uh, because you know chloroquine is dealing with malaria, and now in, in the genomes that you just mentioned, that there are, um, there are, there are, the children are in a very bad situation in general, the population because of of, of uh, um, uh, this nutrition. Uh, because uh, uh, you know the, uh, the, the uh, illegal gold mining is killing the, the fishes and the, the sources of, of, of food, and, and though they, they become more, more vulnerable to malaria. And then now that is needed, the, the government is not sending chloroquine, so they send chloroquine for for COVID. And now that uh, this is so crazy, I mean, it's like uh, unbelievable. Um, but um, uh, we don't have internationally the legal tools with the, to do with the, uh, to deal with the genocide that is going on in Brazil because you know all the, the legal international legal system against uh, genocide is, is for armed genocide for um, intended um, and, um, um, genocide through you know violence but what is going on in Brazil is like a genocide through inaction so basically. The, the state policies to do nothing, and then you know all these destructive forces that are in the, in the, in the territory uh, invade and um, and pollute and destroy, uh, and that's much more difficult to demonstrate. Uh, and uh, and we don't have the legal tools internationally to demonstrate genocide through <laughs> by inaction. Um, so it's, it's it's extremely serious situation, and I hope I really hope that this year will change and. Uh, um, I don't think that uh, the current president will be reelected, and you know, let's see what the next government uh, will do. But um, things will change. Let's let's be optimistic. Also, for for you and your colleagues, uh, has been terrible years, and uh, because well, maybe people don't know, but you, the National Museum uh, was born uh, um, two years ago, three years ago, and. Uh, and then, uh, well, you, you now you don't have a place, <laughs> yeah, to to work. Um, so, a uh, 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 huge archive um, uh, has been lost. Uh, uh, many, uh, many very valuable uh, items, and and um, yeah, they are a part of the of the Brazilian history and and cultural uh, rich, richness has been definitely uh, lost. So it has been very, very bad years for, <laughs> for anthropologists in general. So, but um, let's hope that this year things will change. So thanks a lot uh, again, Aparecida. It was very nice meeting you and talk, talking to you. And I hope that uh, we will meet again uh, soon, uh, hopefully personally. Yeah, thank you. We are not so far away from each other, so maybe we will meet. Okay. Yeah.